I am Jane Milne. And I'm Marilyn Antonucci. Our trunk, skirts and stethoscopes, shares the stories of women who overcame hardship and bias in the field of medicine. Barriers were broken and a foundation was established for acceptance into a male-dominated profession. In 1849, Elizabeth Blackwell did what no other woman in the United States had ever done. She graduated from an American medical school, the Geneva College of Medicine in New York, and found herself barred from practicing medicine in any clinic or hospital in New York City. In order to apply her medical training, she opened her own clinic for impoverished women. Eight years later, she banded together with two other women doctors to expand this clinic, and it became known as the New York Infirmary for Women and Children. And by the 1860s, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell had established a medical college for women. And she, uh, if they, if they were uh, unable to establish a practice in a male-dominated setting, they started something on their own, maybe first in their home or perhaps creating something new. If they were ostracized in the east, they came west. If, they, uh, if a big city like Denver wouldn't accept them, they went to a smaller place, perhaps like Pueblo. And if that didn't work, maybe they went to a rural area or a mining community. The 1890 census showed that there were 59 women physicians and surgeons in the state of Colorado, and nine of them were in Pueblo County. Did you know that a Dr. Minnie Love started uh, what were summer tent camps for children, little infants up to five years of age? She felt that they would be benefited by the, the uh, altitude and the warm sunlight, and that was the forerunner to the renowned Denver Children's Hospital. And now, I would like you to put aside your, your bias about, about ghosts. <laughs> As the spirit of a woman doctor about 1900 slips into the waiting room of a private medical practice. Good morning, Dr. James. Oh, there you are again. My staff said they had seen you back in the hallways, but not like I saw you last week. Oh, you should have seen your face, and you kept taking your glasses off and polishing them. Oh, and, 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 and that squint. Well, now you're talking to me. It, I really need a strong cup of coffee. <laughs> I just, uh, this is too much. Uh, I suppose you want to follow me around now and tell me how things used to be in your day, right? Yes, you know, Dr. Jane, I'll bet you were more curious than frightened. A good trait for a woman in medicine. Well, that's the way it is, and? Yes, you know, when I started my practice in 1895, there were very many days when that little waiting room inside my home was empty. It looks like you've got a lot of patients to see well, this morning. Well, I, I do, uh, but I have a nurse and a physician's assistant that will be helping me with, with the patient load. Um, I guess 
I guess I can let you glance at some of these files if you insist. Oh, oh yes, oh my. Well, who are you going to see this morning? Well, I have a mother coming in with her baby and she will be here for vaccinations. Uh, my assistant will help her with that, so okay. that takes care of her. Vaccinations? No more measles? No more diphtheria, no more chicken pox, no more mumps, no more tetanus. Those babies have a wonderful chance of making it to adulthood. Why, I've seen whole families wiped out by these diseases. Yes, for instance, the Fred Harvey fan family. Fred was uh, the one who opened up uh, lunch counters and so on along the Santa Fe Railroad around 1900. He originally got yellow fever and then he got typhoid fever and then after the birth of his second little son his wife died of complications from that pregnancy and as if that weren't enough each of those little boys in turn died of scarlet fever. Oh yes this was so common. Uh, but you know, as tragic as that story is, there was one bright spot. Not many people realize that one of the main duties of a doctor was to vaccinate against smallpox. That was the one disease that we did have some defense against. And you know, smallpox has been with humanity for thousands and hundreds of years. In the Middle Ages, it was a killer why most of the population of medieval Europe contracted smallpox. And a third of those people died. But it's an interesting story, and I'm sure you oh, learned this. Oh, please tell, tell yes, me. Yes, yes I've heard about school. it. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, uh, the survivors that had smallpox, those who were lucky enough to live through that horrible disease, they had pitted cheeks. They had pock marks in their faces. And that is why it was called smallpox, because it left the pit marks in their faces. But interestingly enough, milkmaids never seem to get the disease. In fact, milkmaids were renowned for their beauty because they had these unblemished complexions. And there was to be an old saying, as fair as, as a milkmaid's milk skin. Yes, yes. yes. Mm. Well, you know, what was taking place was the milkmaids, when they milked their cows, unbeknown to them, their cows had a disease called cowpox and it presented on the udders of the cow as blisters. Mm -hmm. And as the milkmaids were milking their cows, if the milkmaid had an open cut or a scratch on her hand, that cowpox was transferred into her system. And she got this mild rash, but she never developed smallpox. Well, you know, Edward Jenner said, now why is that, that these milkmaids have such beautiful skins, they never seem to get smallpox, and he said, it must be the cowpox, and I'm going to experiment by inoculating children, and he took the contents from the cowpox and he scratched it into the children and they didn't get smallpox and that's how we developed that vaccination um you know in fact the word vaccine
comes from the Latin word vaca, uh -huh. which, which means cow. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, now you know. <laughs> but that was smallpox. As for the rest of the diseases that you were telling us about, there was only thing, one thing we could do, quarantine entire households, sometimes blocks of people were shut up in their homes for weeks at a time. No one could go in and no one could come out. And if you broke quarantine, you would be arrested and taken back to your house. Quarantine, that is a word that I'll bet most of the patients coming in today, if they've heard of it, they don't know what it means. I'll bet. Well, you know, again, it goes way back in time. The word quarantine comes from the Italian quaranto giorni, which means literally 40 days. And during the Middle Ages, when they were ravaged with the Black Death, and plague was everywhere, and ships were coming into port. The people on the coastal cities said, those ships might be carrying the Black Death. And so they have to sit out an anchor in the bay for 40 days because those people on that ship, they'll either all be dead or they will have survived the disease. And then they can come on to shore. Right. Well, before uh, antibiotics, quarantine was really the only way we had to control the spread of diseases. Now, for instance, Mr. McKenzie, he's coming in here this morning. He's complaining of a sore throat. My nurse will take him back. She'll swab his throat and we'll send the culture off to the lab and within 24 hours we will have a report as to whether or not he has strep and if he does we'll prescribe an antibiotic and then within another 24 hours he will not be contagious that's how wonderful things are going today well in my time we had granny remedies <laughs> you know things that granny swore by okay. Uh, now, if you had a sore throat in my time, why Granny might tell you, take a piece of bacon and sprinkle it with black pepper and wrap it around your throat. Oh, there you go again. There <laughs> yes. you go again oh. with those remedies. Oh, oh my yes. goodness. And uh, here's one. Uh, if you wanted to preserve your teeth for oral hygiene, Every morning, rinse your mouth with urine. Oh. <laughs> or for rheumatism, if you wanted to ward off rheumatism, why just stick a horse chestnut in your pocket? Oh, of course. <laughs> Everybody knows that, right? <laughs> the golden age of quackery. Oh, my. What a lot of ignorance you had to overcome. Oh. You have no idea. Oh my, what a wonderful clinic you have here. And you can practice in the hospitals. Oh yes, yes, yes. Well, things have changed quite a bit since you practiced, but I still have a number of women and children to look after. You know, Dr. Jane, if it hadn't been for the women and children, I would have had no practice. Mm. Why? very idea of a woman doctor was scandalous. A woman's place was in the home. There was such a stringent social order when I was raised. Women were subservient to a father or a husband or even their brothers. Why, we were told Higher education is unhealthy for women. Imagine. 
we argued it was the women in the home who took care of the sick and the injured. So our interest in medicine was a natural extension of those feminine duties. Well, I must admit that history does show us that women were the caregivers for the soldiers that were injured and uh, sick. And as you say, they were just doing what was a natural thing that they'd always done in their own homes. And you know, it was that logic that cracked the door open for us. Still, medical schools rarely accepted a woman. But that changed after the Civil War. So many men decided to go west seek their fortunes and to get land. And that cut down on the enrollment in these medical schools. So the medical school said, well, I guess we'll have to start accepting these women. And the women were ready to go. They had had battlefield experience during the Civil War, and they wanted to learn more about medicine. Why, even some of the doctors in the Civil War admitted, you know, if those women had had better training, mm -hmm. there would have been far fewer deaths. So, a few progressive schools, like the University of Michigan, yes, yes. yes, they opened their doors to women, to the horror of the male students. <laughs> Did you know they demanded that the women students attend separate anatomy classes? Imagine. Well, it was considered so offensive for a woman to be in the same room as a man studying a cadaver. A naked, a naked. cadaver. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, oh. yes. Oh, goodness. Well, I remember my time in, in medical school in the 1960s. Um, I wasn't that well received. However, we did have co-ed anatomy classes, and throughout we had co-ed classes. But what could you do when so few schools would admit women? What, obviously there was a high demand for this. What, what did you do? Well, we did what women have always done. We banded together. We joined forces. You know, wealthy women gave donations to these medical schools. And they said, we will give you money, but you have to admit women. And the Quakers, you know the Quakers always felt that men and women were created equally. And they opened their own schools for their daughters. Eventually, there were several medical schools opened only for female students. How about that? Yeah. yeah. Because the majority of women physicians were not admitted to medical societies. And therefore, they couldn't practice in a hospital or a clinic. They opened their own clinics. And by banding together, they built their own hospitals. Yes. Well, all that seems plausible. Uh, you were, I can tell you though, that it took decades to break down these barriers. But the federal government in 1965 created uh, something called the Higher Education Act. And in 1972, it was amended, and the outcome of that was called uh, Chapter 9 and uh, Title IX, excuse me. And that meant that you could not uh, base admittance uh, on, on gender. It was open to all. So by 1976, the numbers of women in medical schools had gone up 
and today it's just about 50-50. That's -50. <laughs> good for us, huh? You know, there always was a clear connection between medicine and feminism. Many of us went into medicine because we wanted to change that male-dominated society. We railed against wearing corsets that bent our spines and crushed internal organs, all for fashion's sake, to attract a man. A man. Yes. Oh my, oh my. Now, I suppose that you want to talk about the women doctors back in your day and all the things that they did. Well, remember, we have patients, I have patients to see, so uh, let's not take too long. <laughs> well, let me see now. Yes, I believe it was about 1895 when I began my practice. Why, I remember uh, there was a woman doctor in Denver. Oh, what was her name now? Oh, let me see. Dr. Mary Bates. She was the first woman in Denver to wear a divided skirt so she could ride her bicycle. <laughs> You know, we were suffragettes. We advocated for the protection of women and children. And let me tell you, one of the main reasons those men didn't want us in the medical profession, delivering babies was a steady source of income for them. And they were afraid we would cut into their profits. Oh, my. Why? There were obstetric hospitals. And those men who ran them, do you know they wouldn't even allow a woman physician on their staff? Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, when you're up against that type of mentality, you really well, it's hard, hard to practice medicine. I don't know how you ever did it. Well, I know that women often did come west. Uh, Doc Susie Anderson, um, she had gotten TB during medical school. And it wasn't getting any better. And she decided that she needed to go up higher, colder, drier, sunnier air. She put herself on a train to Fraser, Colorado, which was known as the icebox of the nation. And she did heal herself, and she practiced medicine up there for 47 years. And she was a beloved member of that community. And did you know that her first patient was a horse yes. who got tangled up in barbed wire. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> and you know, in those days, medical supplies were so scarce. And Doc Susie, living clear up in the remote mountains, why, Doc Susie was so frugal that she would take the bandages that she had used on one patient she would wash them and iron them and use them on the next patient. Oh, what do I have here? Oh, a pair of pliers. Did you use these to tighten the wheels on the, the doctor's buggy? <laughs> oh, my, no. You know, there weren't many dentists in my oh. day. <laughs> <laughs> Two things. Oh, that was a common ailment. Why, by the time people reach the age of 50, half of them would be absolutely toothless. Oh, yes. Well, you know, your bag was really your traveling office. So if you didn't have it in here, you didn't have it. Well, shall we look and see some, what some, some of these things are? Yes, we will. Now, you know, we had to travel and make house calls. And we traveled the remote countryside in the dark of night all by ourselves. And we used a horse and buggy, 
Oh, yes, there's a wonderful horse and buggy at the Pueblo Heritage Museum. You really ought to see that. Try to imagine, you get a call to take care of a sick person. It's winter, it's nighttime, it's dark, it's, it's going to be dangerous out there. Doc Susie always had a pistol in her bag. Well, you know, there was Dr. Harriet Wingham over in Montrose, and her friend was so worried about her. She said, Harriet, you've got to carry a gun. You can't be driving that horse and buggy out in the middle of nowhere in the dark of night all by yourself. Please put a gun in your bag. And Harriet says, all right, all right. I'll put a gun in my bag. But what her friend didn't know, Harriet locked the bullets in her desk drawer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, as I say, you're traveling. You're, this is like your, this is your traveling office. Yes, you yeah. know we had to diagnose and make treatments right there on the spot. And what we had in our bag, that's all that we had. So, oh, now look at this. Oh, the stethoscope. And I know yes. you yes. have uh, one yes. of these. Yes, and I, I yes. yes, oh, absolutely. Yes. We had our stethoscopes. And, oh, I'll bet that looks familiar to you. Mm -hmm. Looks pretty much the same today, doesn't it? Yes, you know that blood pressure cuff and the principles haven't changed. Except, of course, mine was in a handmade wooden box. Right. Mm. And let's see. Oh, I also have instruments to examine of your ears. And then what about this guy? Well, I could put this on and look inside your eyes. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, let's see, what else in here? Oh, when you got this out. Oh, mm -hmm. people shuddered. <laughs> they shuddered and they said, oh, no, not that little black box because this contained my scalpel. <laughs> and of course, you know, I did <coughs> surgeries right there in someone's house if it was necessary. With no anesthetic, of course. Oh, my. Mm. Where's the whiskey, Jane? <laughs> That's right. Oh, and then we have Suture scissors? Oh, I did a lot of sewing in my day. I never <laughs> ran those feminine duties. Mm. Oh, tell them about, look at this. Uh, is that sterling silver? This, my dear, is my hypodermic syringe, minus the needles, handmade glass. Yes. Mm. People didn't want to see this come out of my bag either because the needle was in proportion to the size of the syringe. And then what about this guy? Oh, now I'll bet you still use this. Oh, for strep throat, you know. Yes, what a handy little item this was. You know, I could detect diphtheria by looking in your throat with a tongue depressor. Mm. And then we have these old-fashioned bottles. You know, many pharmacists, like Doc Susie would get things from Denver, set up on the train to Frazier, and, and she would ask the, the pharmacist to make a compound out of this or that, and often they appeared in bottles like this. Yes, and you know, some of us, we, we had very limited uh, numbers of medications that we could give. And some of us compounded our own medicines. We made our own pills and we took them with us to treat what we found when we got there. And of course, we're never totally sure what we were going to find when uh, we got oh. there. And you know, back then, uh, if a woman was uh, getting ready to deliver a baby, the uh, doctor would pack her bag 
and go prepared to stay several days until the mother had the baby and, um, and then uh, made sure that everything was going well. Oh, there were so many complications. You just couldn't deliver a baby and skedaddle. Oh my, no. Mm -hmm. And we always had our forceps <laughs> with us. The small one was used to assist in the delivery of a baby's head, if necessary. And what else there were, well, you know, oh, in childbirth, there were complications. And if a baby was in a breech position, why? We had to use the long forceps to go in and assist that baby in turning around so it could be safely delivered. Oh, yes. You know, what a service you provided for the community. You really did. And I know it was so difficult to become accepted. And I'm thinking about a Dr. Richard Corwin, who was hired by the CFNI to take care of the workers and their families and also those in the mining camps. He, he was a, a, a wonderful man. He hired women yes. doctors. He set up a nursing school for women. He, um, he, you know, we had so many immigrants coming from everywhere at that time, speaking all these different languages. He would set up night school classes for English and maybe homemaking skills. Whatever seemed to be needed, he oversaw and it had happened. And he even set up, uh, he had, had the idea of building ramps in public places like at Keating and Central High School to make it easier for people to uh, move around. Yes, He oh, was a wonderful yes. advocate. He was, you know, I remember he had women doctors on his staff. Why, I knew Dr. Mary Twyford. She was an anesthetist. And Dr. Josephine Dunlop, why she was a pathologist. And Dr. Dunlop, why she was credited during the Spanish influenza outbreak in 1918 that hit all of the communities and the outlying mining camps. She had such stringent hygiene protocols at those mining camps that they came out of that influenza outbreak far better than most places in the country. Yes, indeed. Um, you know, it was considered quite daring for Dr. Corwin to engage women physicians. Maybe it was because he accepted one by mistake. How, how could he have accepted one by mistake? Hmm, that doesn't well, mean... Well, let me tell you about uh, this must be an interesting story. Uh, Dr. Jean Clow, who wrote, sent in a written application for uh, an opening. He was astonished when a woman stepped off of that train down there at the depot Dr. instead Jean. of a man. <laughs> yes, indeed. But you know, he honored his commitment and he brought her onto his staff, and she became the first woman to intern at Corbin Hospital. Other women physicians had already made their mark. Mary Berry, well, you know Mary Berry? She was the first woman to be elected to the Colorado legislature in 1898. And, oh, I have to tell you about my dear friend, Ryla Hay. She, she was the first woman hired as a consultant at the Colorado Insane Asylum. Yes, mm. and she was also the first woman from Pueblo County to be admitted to the Colorado Medical Society. That was something, let me tell you. And she was a fine doctor, but she was also a surgeon. And could she diagnose? She, well, Ryla, 
She was married to the minister at Central Christian Church. You know that beautiful church up there at 7th and Albany? Mm -hmm. She was a minister's wife. She was the mother of four children and a doctor. And she always found time to go to Denver to learn the newest medical techniques. Amazing woman, when you think about it. I know that Clark Mineral uh, Tuberculosis Sanitarium uh, employed uh, women physicians. You know that wonderful spring water and then our clear air and sunny days. It was a good uh, setting for, for curing TB. Now, we don't have to deal with TB very much anymore, thank goodness, but um, we can still drink that clear water. Now, uh, it's almost time for me to start these pa the seeing these patients. Um, Mrs. Espinosa is here for her six-month prenatal checkup. She's been taking her vitamins. She and her husband have been attending the, the, the classes. She has really set herself up for a, a good future with that baby. And, uh, you know, childbirth has, has traditionally been such a dangerous yes. time. Terrible. I'm sure Terrible. any of you could tell stories about grandmothers or great-grandmothers that have not made it through because of uh, probably infections and, and other complications. Yes. So, yes, you know, Dr. Jane, women dying during childbirth or complications after, it was so common. And that's why many of us women went into medicine in the first place. Uh, we were dedicated to improving the treatment of women and children. You know, opium medication, that was the most prescribed medicine for any gynecological problem. Why, they even gave it to babies while they were teething. Can you imagine that? Mm. You know, uh, and that's why we saw so much more addiction among women than men back in my time. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, infection after childbirth, as we've talked about, is still a problem. The difference is we have a whole arsenal of medications that we can address those problems, and so you don't hear about that much today. That's and you didn't even have penicillin. Oh my, no. Why, penicillin didn't come into effect until World War II. World War II. And you know, most of us early women physicians, us women doctors, why, we were in the great beyond by then. Mm, right. Uh, but we did have microscopes, and we understood germs and the transmission of disease. We spent most of our time and energy educating our women patients. Keep your home sanitary. Uh, wash your hands. Cover that cough. All these things went a long way to prevent the spread of disease. And you know, I spend a lot of time discussing that very thing today. We. We are to wash our hands, some say to, the, to singing the song, happy birthday, keep washing until you've sung the song. Uh, cover your mouth with, uh, when you're coughing and sneezing. Still, it really, really works. Uh, little four-year-old Tommy's coming in this morning too. Got his record right here. Um, he's complaining of a tummy ache. Now, we don't know whether Tommy ate too many cookies or whether this is something really uh, genuine, but, but we have to find out. So we've got to take a look at him. Well, and looking through here, I see that you have a Mr. Bates is coming in yes, this morning. Yes, he's coming too. Yes, he's got a broken arm. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to x-ray the arm and make sure it's healing properly. Well, you know, in my day, uh, that arm may very well have healed crooked and that left uh, weak and misformed for the rest of his life. You know, mercifully, mercifully, the needs 
have changed so much since I started practicing medicine in Pueblo. What a diverse community it was. And you know, for the most part, women doctors in Pueblo were accepted. I practiced medicine for 35 years, and in that span of time, there were 25 women physicians in Pueblo County. Now some came and some went, but for the most part, they stayed and they were accepted. And our greatest strength was in mentoring the young women who decided to go into medicine as their profession. You know, you'll be happy to know this. I have a young uh, intern doing that very thing in my clinic, and it's working out very well. And now it really is time for me to yes. start seeing these patients. Yes, it is. <laughs> but before I go, I want to thank you so much for sharing your legacy with me. It makes me so happy that I'm practicing medicine today and not back in your day. Well, you know, throughout history, women have always been the caregivers, the nurturers, and the healers. And finally, they are beginning to be recognized and compensated for the advances that they have made. You know, they may have traded in these long skirts, but their okay. legacy <laughs> in medicine is obvious. Thank you so much.